Good question. Look, it has to get fixed within the Constitution. And if it doesn't, then then you're you're kind of off script. And uh, and then who knows how it settles. Yep. And and going off script is a is a uh, is a horror you can't even imagine. I've been to enough war torn areas and, and places ripped apart, and um, I saw it um, in Bosnia, in Serbia, in Croatia. Um, I was there right before and right after that civil war started, and it's really ugly. We suffer in America from affluenza. That's a term I, I coined, right? We have so much money. There is so much wealth and so much comfort that people really forget completely about the basics. And, uh, and that's the real danger because in a, in a conflict, like I was describing in Yugoslavia, things get tribal, things get medieval really quickly. So, uh, Eric, thank you so much for, for joining us again. It's great to have you on the podcast. Glad to be here, guys. Uh, so jumping straight into things, uh, do you think that uh, there will be some version of, of Blackwater, so privatized security in the U.S. as things continue to get uh, crazier and crazier socially and politically in our own country? Uh, well, there's lots of other competitors that still survived, and the State Department still pays for armed security for embassies and um, federal agencies still contract for training services. So yeah, there's lots of, lots of other competitors. I think um, I sold that business to a couple of Texas investors and then they sold it to a hedge fund. And now, so now it's run like a typical Beltway company would be uh, without yeah. quite this, well, without quite the spirit or the, the bravery that, um, uh, that the previous company had. Do you think we'll see something like that for American citizens in country? So, you know, you live in a big city, urban, urban setting, uh, San Francisco, uh, likes, you know, environment. So, uh, and you'll be able to contract. No, security. The, 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 the better a- uh, analog for that is, um, is what you see in South Africa as you've, as you've had all kinds of cities that have completely melted where there's no law and order and the police are absent or corrupt and even worse, part of the problem, part of the kidnapping problem, um, you'll see, you see there, significant armed security patrols uh, protecting neighborhoods. And the neighborhoods there have effectively become little, um, little fortresses with uh, 14 foot high electrified barbed wire fences with no kidding, um, uh, security gates that would that would rival that of entering a U.S. Mm-hmm. military base, and that's the norm for neighborhoods in Johannesburg, Cape Town, etc. And are um, those are those self organizing neighborhoods? Or are they? Is it a group that's? Going it's almost in like it's it's, it's no, it's like a homeowners association gotcha. with with teeth. Um, and they have and they have and they have to because they have roving black gangs that follow cars home and ambush them and take over houses. And it's really terrible. There's, there's dozens of farm murders going. I mean, look, it, it happens in the city. You have urban crime, but you also happens in South Africa with rural crime uh, where a gang will roll up on a farmhouse and overwhelm the, the, the mom, dad, and two or three kids and end up, I mean, it's terrible, terrible stories of, Kids being killed, babies being microwaved, um, just you know the, the woman's raped repeatedly in front of the husband before he's executed. It's just, it's almost like you saw in um, in Gaza uh, a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, depravity knows no limits and is not limited to uh, to the Middle East or to South America or to South Africa or uh, or and. and Sadly, that can come to America as well. So, yeah, nature hates a vacuum and something's going to fill it. And uh, if the state fails to provide security for its citizens, citizens are going to organize themselves and secure themselves somehow. Yeah. And you all did, I think it was Hurricane Katrina. Um, you all provided support down there. Do you see that type of support growing as, I think, part of what Santiago's 
getting um, at is just like the continued unrest locally that we didn't see, you know, maybe more like in the 80s and 90s. Um, is that going to be a continued factor? Sure. Uh, look, when, when Hurricane Katrina happened, we had no, so we were at that point, that was 2005. Blackwater, we did training, we did aviation support, we obviously did security support overseas. We had no plans to do domestic stuff at all. And I remember just finishing a, um, a surveillance exercise, actually. I was in South Florida, and Hurricane Katrina had rolled across South Florida um, already while I was there. And it carried on and obviously smashed into Louisiana and the Gulf Coast. Um, and I remember seeing the, um, the people on the rooftops and all the rest, and I remember calling our air boss, and we'd just taken delivery of a Puma helicopter, which is about the – it's a little bit bigger than a Blackhawk. Um, and we were going to be sending that for, for work overseas, but I said, listen, put the, uh, he said, the crew just arrived. I said, put them to bed, reset their crew rest and start, just start flying towards Louisiana tomorrow and we'll figure it out. And by the time they got there by noon that day, um, uh, our, our aircraft, November 505 became Coast Guard 505. And, um, and we ended up rescuing, uh, evacuating a lot of people for the Coast Guard. In, in, in cooperation with them. And then the private sector started calling because uh, if you remember the videos there, even some of the police force was participating in the looting. Um, and so companies called, individuals called, um, Bell South, Walmart, big insurance companies. And uh, we ended up sending, I think there's 128 guys in the first 36 hours. And Again, because we had, we got licensed quickly um, through a connection with the state of Louisiana, and um, we just had lots of capable, willing people, and we had the supplies to do that, and uh, and that was great. The difference, you know, you see a lot of um, well-meaning people that come to a um, an area after a disaster, whether it's a um, a tornado or an earthquake or whatever. Um, and they come by ones and twos and threes. The difference with this is the devastation was so broad and so deep that there was no infrastructure left. So we needed, um, uh, I guess, the, the greater heft of a bigger organization that could do the logistics support. Because it's one thing to show up with stuff on your back and you can survive for two or three days as you're doing security. But to, to stay for the long term, you need um, food, fuel, sanitation, um, some kind of accommodation. So... It worked, no, yep. and 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 that's um, there's a lot of American spirit to do that yet. Um, there's lots of uh, uh, smaller organizations that can do that, but I would I would not expect that kind of um, rapid or innovative response from the big Beltway companies because it just the the Beltway and the federal government tends to drive any innovation any in. Uh, innovation, spirit of performance or, or mission focus out of its vendors. And it's not what those, the leaders of those companies are not rewarded for being brave or bold. Um, I remember, um, so we had our, our guys there for the first few days. Um, and then the FEMA, uh, came to us and said, could you please provide a lot more armed security people? Uh, and they said, because we'd asked, the, they'd asked FEMA, one federal agency asked the Federal Protective Service, part of DHS, uh, if they would go. And they said, no, the conditions are too rough and too unsafe. Thus, the d destroyed infrastructure, our employee union won't let us go. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, all these, these hundreds of, um, of already on salary federal policemen, uh, their union prevented them from going. So when people, when people whine, well, why is the private sector doing that? Because sometimes the government just is not getting the job done. So we um, we went, and and why I'm so proud of that uh, that old Blackwater team is, you know, tents were backordered for months or years because there was two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so all the other home, you know, logistics support, but the the guys just figured it out. We we bought circus tents. We um, uh, we took uh, like a tow behind car trailer a 24 foot car trailer and the guys turned them into a mobile shower and uh, ablution facilities and, and just make it work. So 
Um, I love employing people with that kind of spirit. Yeah. So we wanted to ask you a little bit about when you first started Blackwater and how that all came to be. And if for people who might be listening, um, you did a bunch of or several interviews with Sean Ryan that are really good um, that get into some of this. But so when you when you first were kicking off Blackwater, were you just from your perspective, were you thinking I'm starting a, um, a training facility and this is what I'm going to do long term? Or did you have a larger uh, project in mind of thinking I'm going to build this up into a larger organization? Um, I would say some of both. Um, I guess when you're starting a business, you start for what the immediate, uh, what is the immediate problem I'm going to solve for a customer that we can get paid for. Right. And so yeah. I, I knew, um, I had a pretty good idea what the, the, at least the SEAL teams needed or could use and what other special operations type units could use. Uh, you know, governments had been using, or sorry, yep, yeah, U.S. entities have been using private firms really since the 1970s on a small scale. Um, but no one had done it on a big industrial scale. And because of my father's success, I was able to do that. Um, but I remember, uh, on the day we opened the place, I had a, there was a, there was kind of a sketch that I also framed, uh, of what the place would look like in a few years. And, you know, that was kind of the 10 year goal and it got there at about year five. Wow. Uh, and so, so that was to include driving facility and runway and a bigger mount facility and, and all those kind of things. Um, and I, you know, I already, I would, I guess any observer could, could realize how pathetic UN peacekeeping was and how ineffective that kind of, uh, stability operations were. And, um, and I read a lot of history and I really, uh, I really abhor these kind of um, uh, total meltdowns and destruction of these of these places that are really enabled by a few warlords with guns. And so, I guess a combination of um, doing the training, and we got very good at that, and uh, realizing what else we could be. So as we got into the security business, at the same time, I was um, so my dad. My dad started in the diecast machinery business in 1965. It's a big machine that squeezes a mold together uh, under high pressure and it injects molten uh, aluminum or magnesium. So the rims of your car, the engine block of your car, the transmission casing are probably all die castings, for example. Uh, or if you have a gas grill, it's usually a, a aluminum die casting. So we made, mm. he, he made those machines and um, the automotive business side of it grew really well, huge. And the machinery business had, uh, had kind of, uh, bumped along. So I, I took that over, uh, when I got out of the seal teams. And so at the same time I was taking that through a, a lean transformation and trying to make it more efficient, run faster, better. Um, I read a lot, um, the machine that changed the world, the goal, stuff like that. And, and so, you know, I, I got to thinking, because if you're trying to trying to lean out a business, you think about, all right, what are we going to do on our supply chain? Once the, once the supplies reach the factory floor, how long is it sitting there before it's getting processed? And how long does it take to literally travel through the factory? Um, to the point that, it, you know, in, 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 in a lot of manufacturing that's very old school and maybe a bit uh, bollocked up, they put a date and a, and a receipt on a piece of uh, inventory when it first arrives at the factory with a date. And so you finally see when it makes it through the factory. And so all that time it's waiting there, it's cost, it's money, it's tied up. And, and so if you're leaning out of business, you're trying to obviously smooth uh, that process. And so as I'm thinking about how to smooth out a factory, we're also doing black water and the training. And I kind of had a goal of what we wanted to be. And it really kind of, it, it made me break down the process of, of what does a military do? It recruits, vets, equips, trains, deploys, and supports people. And so as we're building out the facility, we put those processes in place. So it was almost a linear process all in one compound, which allowed us to be very cost competitive and very responsive to small, medium, or even very large customer requirements. So, Eric, it, um, oh, go ahead. 
Nope. Go ahead. I'm, point. Point done. I was just gonna say. So, how do you how do you figure out the uh, the, the the pricing? You start uh, the economics of, of the business, as it were. You 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 launch this. You, you have a you know through your family extensive business experience, but you launch into an industry that most people don't don't break into. There's not like a Harvard business book, you know, on on how to on uh, the economics of, of primary military contracting. Uh, I was listening to Simon Mann talk about executive outcomes and. Yeah, he was he was describing how they had some interesting scenarios where you know governments would call and be like, "How much do you? How much will you charge me to protect my my air? You know my airfield?" And they're like, "Well, let's. I'll give you a call back. Let me figure it out." Uh, so how did you how did you start getting into that business from a pricing perspective and, and the economics of it? Uh, well, I guess it started with what we with what we knew. We knew training, and uh, and there you kind of build up. What is a what is a great instructor cost per day or per week? And we, we put a margin on that. Um, excuse me, guys. Sorry about that. Um, we put a margin on that. Um, obviously, the facility, we weren't borrowing a facility. We had our own facility. So we had some kind of a fixed cost for that, a little bit of overhead. And, and obviously, that worked uh, because um, – I remember, and, and so we, we just kind of started with retail stuff, offering it to individuals or to SEAL teams, et cetera. And, um, you know, when we first started bidding on some of these bigger government contracts, uh, I remember the State Department came back to us and said, um, we just, we couldn't submit a price that low because it was not credible. So we added a huge percentage to it and then they found it credible and they took it. So it was, you know, by integrating and really focusing on squeezing out cost. Um, we're good. I remember, um, I remember reading a book early on that there's, you know, three approaches of a business. You can focus on, on operational efficiency to just drive out cost, kind of the Walmart model. There's the product innovation model where you make, make the next product that somebody just has to buy. Or third is customer intimacy where you so embed yourself in your customer's process that they can hardly operate without you. And I guess we, we really focused on being super cost effective first and serving the hell out of the customers so they didn't want didn't to operate without us. So, but again, so we start with training and then you start with, um, with manpower, right? If you're doing security, that I, huh, I remember the first overseas security job was a, a very urgent one. And um, obviously manpower, what is it, what, what it going to cost to put a very high quality guy with a very unique skill set abroad in a place where they can get shot or blown up uh, and you have to feed them, support them. Um, you have to travel. Insurance is a, is a huge uh, issue for that. So that's a little bit of experience you can draw on and, and just understanding what the, um, what the market holds. We, um, we really focused on growing the pool of people um, and we probably, um, Gary Jackson, the, the president of Blackwater, and I have to give pretty much all the credit of Blackwater to him and the team that he built. Because I might have been the idea guy and the money guy, but Gary made all the trains run on time. And he did so, he, and he made it almost look easy. Uh, but he was an early um, computer geek, and he remember he developed our website while he was uh, the platoon commander on a counter drug deployment in the Bahamas with a with an early fourteen four modem off his laptop in nineteen ninety seven. Wow! And yeah, <laughs> um, and um, but he developed an early kind of our early version of social media, which was uh, the Blackwater Tactical Weekly, which was a a, a news site a, a newsletter that he would email out, and it grew to where it would reach. 250,000 people. And then if we had an unusual recruiting requirement, if we needed some some weird, rare skill set, we'd blast it out to the Blackwater Tactical Weekly. And if we didn't get a response, we'd send it out again, but we'd put a bounty on it and say, mm. you find us this guy, 500 bucks or whatever. Man, we'd have, we'd have 10 resumes by the next morning. So uh, that really worked. And that grew, our database grew to, I think it was 45,000. Uh, when I sold the business and it was for, and you could, you could search by every kind of skill set, nationality, 
uh, whatever. I mean, the vast majority of everyone we employed in the Blackwater days was all American citizens because there was citizenship requirements. But um, that's um, it was a it was a great tool, and the fact that we could do the vetting, the psych evaluations, the medical, obviously the training and uh, equipping all on site greatly accelerated uh, our process and 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 helped us to be very price competitive. When um, I remember, we were even called. Um, back in the Bush administration, there was talk about growing the border patrol because the border was an issue back then, 20 years ago already. And we got called to testify by the then Homeland Security Committee because CBP was saying that they needed something like $110,000, $120,000 to train each new border patrol agent. And we were, they kind of shocked by that. So they put us up by comparison, and we knew training. We trained tens of thousands of people a year, um, and and it, the price for our curriculum was going to be probably forty versus hundred. So we were, you know, we were a third, and um, I cannot even imagine what the CBP people said to us after the hearing about uh, how pissed they were that we we you know. But they said, "Look, we we can control our costs. You, the government, cannot." But it's a great example. You guys come from a free market background. If you really let the, pr- the the private sector run and innovate, you will find ways to drive out costs and, impre- and, and improve um, the, the customer uh, experience. Was there a sense when you all were early on that like we're leaving money on the table because competitors are charging so much more, they're going to be able to use that to get ahead? Was was there any uh, no. second thoughts there? No, no, it, no, because we knew we, in, any visit to any of the, the call it the Beltway competitors headquarters, you knew how bloated they were. Yeah. It was just a look, a bunch of fat old retired guys walking around moving at about the same pace. You know, so in, in our day, we, our, our company did not do golf outings. We did adventure racing. So the, 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 the management would go do a 12 or a 24 hour race on a weekend and it was not a triathlon. It was a off-road endurance race with running, mountain biking, all of which required land nav, kayaking, whatever. But just to go grind for 12 or 24 hours. And it was, it was I think it was very analogous to life and business because you had to make um, decisions based off of imperfect information and you had to live with the consequences. So if you turned right when you were supposed to turn left um, on a mountain trail, yeah, you were – you were sucking. So yeah. it was uh, it was good. It was fun. Fun days. Cool. Eric, talk to me about uh, how this translates to recruiting. I think just that, you know, as an outsider, if I'm presented with a bureaucratic monolithic system and I'm told you could join that or you can join a lean, you know, fast paced group of guys, you know, f- filled with, with with bold and courageous dudes. I'm, I and most of the guys I know are going to choose the second one right? you know, any day of the week. How did this translate for, for you in terms of recruiting and assembling a team? So, you know, when I, I, I remember when I got out of the Navy and uh, I got out earlier than I planned to because, at least for a SEAL officer, the first 12 years are the good ones because that's when you can kind of be operational. It's after that, when you get stuck at a desk. So I'd planned to stay that long. But my, uh, my father died and my wife got cancer at 29. And so I got out to sort that out. Um, but I, I went to start Blackwater and I didn't know anything about land development. I didn't know anything about government contracting and really anything about business. What could go wrong? Um, <laughs> but I, um, you kind of go back to the, you go back to the pool of people, you know, and trust. And so my training officer, uh, actually ended up hiring both training officers and, um, uh, one of the lead firearms instructors uh, that taught me, and I met Gary Jackson. Um, <laughs> I met Gary Jackson along the way while I was a SEAL. Um, one of the one of the collateral duties you have to do when you're a junior officer in, in the military is uh, do the, the legal investigations, called a Jagman investigation, and I had to go invest investigate this SEAL that had gotten into a fight. Uh, and beat the tar out of four or five sailors that jumped him and he had taken the ear off of one of them in a, uh, in a fight over a girl. Of course there was alcohol involved, typical, but Gary, he was assigned then to Gary, um, 
after that, uh, after that incident. And so I met Gary and, and we became fast friends. You go back to the pool that you know, and that was the advantage of at least the SEAL team guys I worked with that I knew that they had um, far surpassed a threshold of performance than even I had because they'd been at it for much longer and been to very elite units. Um, but when it comes to recruiting, I would always over recruit for a position. And that was really, and I, again, that was Gary's um, great strength. Gary never went to college. Um, he, he made, he, he didn't care what school or education you came from, but he had, um, he was comfortable enough with himself that he hired fantastic people in every position. And he managed to keep all kinds of alpha male type performance and behavior in check, all, uh, pointed <laughs> most of the time in the same direction. And he had a great, a great rule. It was called the 15 minute pissed off rule. You can be angry. You can say about anything you want, but after 15 minutes, it's over and you move on. And, you know, Gary had a great eye for spotting talent because um, I think, and, and I didn't, well, at, at some points I must have, but I went from, um, I went outside uh, and I actually hired a professional search firm, paid a lot of money to find a guy to be the the head of Blackwater. This is this is before Gary was uh, mm. was, was was retired, and he was by resume fit perfectly. Retired Marine, recommended by one of the greatest combat Marines I've ever known. Okay, and this guy had gone on after his Marine career to manage. Um, he was doing turnarounds for different um, hotel franchises. So we literally go to hotels and help them turn around on their customer service. So I thought it would be, and by resume, would be the perfect person to run a military type training facility that was also kind of in the hospitality business. Mm. And just sadly, he was, I think, more focused on um, on 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 ho- on hospitality than on on a combat training facility, and uh, and that was a disaster. That was on me. And uh, nice man, I wish him well, but uh, Gary, Gary really built that business. And then, and then I remember Gary, Gary really needed a receptionist. And uh, along comes this twenty-two-year-old new college graduate female with no experience in military, law enforcement, or anything else. She was just moving to the area because her her nephew had leukemia. And uh, and that was Danielle, uh, Danielle Morrison. And Gary ended up hiring her and she actually grew from that role, not knowing anything about that business to being the chief operating officer of the company. And she could swear like a sailor when she had to, and she could put all these alpha males in their place because she knew what she was doing, super competent. And, uh, and so I guess my, my guidance for hiring people is don't trust a resume. Um, I would, um, and I know it's hard to do, you know, in the in the round robin speed dating equivalent of of of, of hiring, hard to dig into people. But uh, but you really got to ask what they do in their off time. What do they do that's uh, that's that's dangerous? Are they comfortable being uncomfortable? If you really want a team that's going to run hard, you have to find people that love to run hard, and that's that doesn't always appear on everybody's resume. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I think, I, I mean, whenever we talk about Blackwater, uh, you know, we've had conversations here and, and, and people online that that seems to be part of the draw for guys, especially is that imagine being with a group of, of guys who are doing dynamic, exciting, almost adventurous kinds of things uh, that, you know, adventure in general is just not not as available these days to, to young men as you know, as, as it may have been once. Well, and, and it was not, it was not, uh, it was not adventure for adventure's sake. It was, um, literally preparing people to go into harm's way or to pe- keep people safe that are in harm's way. I remember, um, one of our earliest, um, uh, like combat shotgun students was a sheriff deputy from Tennessee. And like two weeks after he came through our course, there was a um, a bank robbery 
and uh, they had a, a roadblock, and it was our student that uh, that stopped the car. And there was a, and, and they sent us a newspaper clipping. I remember of this deputy standing there with a shotgun, looking like he just uh, saddled up at high noon. It was pretty freaking cool to say, "Hey, That's we awesome. helped him. We we and in some small way, we helped him do that." Yeah. So you mentioned starting Blackwater, you didn't have a ton of business experience. I assume, you know, there's probably some lessons from your dad that you just learned through osmosis growing up, but you've also For mentioned, sure. yeah. So like that, you've mentioned things like East India Trading Company history. Like what are some of the key influences for you in developing how you actually ended up running uh, the business? Um, my dad, um, so my dad ended up giving his he so compensation is a big part of it. I, a hiring the right people, hiring people that want to run hard. I still remember showing up. I flew over on the first lift we had when we took um, uh, our little birds into Iraq, and it was the only time the government provided us airlift. And so as we're offloading the C fives at two o'clock in the morning in Baghdad, a bunch of guys that that. Um, and at that point, that was just 10 years after Black Hawk Down in Mogadishu. So these were veterans from there. And they said, Mr. P, thanks for letting us do this. This is what we're good at. Um, and so finding the right people that want to do that mission and paying them really well so that they're, they, have, uh, they have incentive. My dad and his business ended up giving 20% of the company to the employees through a like a – uh, Prince Employee Retirement Trust. And I thought long and hard about doing that for BW, but because of the risk, uh, the volat- volatility of the business, um, uh, I instead, it, 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 you know, <laughs> and again, the, the, the experience of my dad's business, the automotive business, had been all domestic, had done almost nothing overseas. And then when my father died and I was getting out of the Navy and then it was a bit of a, um, uh, a mini crisis for my family because we thought, what do we do with this business? Um, we needed a new CEO. It needed to go overseas. And the business, therefore, before then had never really had any debt on it. And so when 20% of your shareholding base is all the employees and all their retirements, it's a very different nut. To, to be risking all your employees' retirements, taking on risk as a business. And because of that, that's why I didn't do 20% or, or company stock uh, in Blackwater for the employees. Instead, I just paid really, really well every year. And um, I remember uh, when it comes to, to bonusing people, I remember uh, Jack Welch, uh, I would say another business influence in, in really driving performance and getting rid of bad performers and really, uh, driving out cost in, uh, cost inefficiencies. But he said, look, rank your employees, A, B's and C's. And so I remember Gary and I, by mid December would go through a list of pretty much all the staff employees and we'd put them in buckets and the A players got huge bonuses, sometimes two, three, or more times size their base pay. Bs would get a substantial bonus. And if, it, if people weren't in that category, the Cs would often just go away. And so we were taking 10 or 15% uh, of the lowest performers out of the business every year. And, um, and that worked and that keeps everybody hard charging and, and driving in the right direction. It seems like, Eric, the more I hear you talking and, and you know, and the interviews with Sean Ryan, you're, you're very grounded as you have to be in, in reality, uh, especially in, a, you know, in our day and age where lots of things are disconnected from the way the real world works. You, you mentioned you go to the woods, if you turn right when you're supposed to turn left, you're, you're going to be sucking. Sucks. Um, yeah, exactly. What is it? So this is sort of a, a high level question, but what is it like? Uh, for you to see sort of behind the curtain, to see the world as it really is, not as it seems. You, you, you look at geopolitics, you can see conflict, you, you see what we see, you know, uh, 
on the surface in the news, you know people on the ground, you know how those countries operate, you know the history behind lots of the conflicts. Uh, what is it like to, to have a peek behind the curtain? Um, someone just asked me a similar question uh, one-on-one because a lot of people want to think that this, this debacle in, in Gaza was some conspiracy. There's no way that the entire Israeli security apparatus and intelligence somehow knew and they let him in. And I say, no, having seen behind the curtain, I see how any, any military can become very complacent. Any military can become way too, and, and the U.S. is just as guilty as, as Israel is of this, that we believe way too much in our own kung fu, right? We get high on our own supply, that our tech, our greatness, our innovation is, is unstoppable. And the bad guys always get a vote. They're always thinking about how they're going to get one over on you. And they really did, um, you know, October 7th. Um, and then also see, well, it took so long for the IDF to respond. Yeah, not surprising. I mean, uh, it, it, it was a holiday, a, a high religious holiday, mm-hmm. 50 years after the anniversary of Yom Kippur, when Israel was also almost surprised and almost overwhelmed. Um, and, and so it comes down to <laughs> individuals pooling together, grouping together, going down and sorting it out. You have all kinds of stories of of a 22 year old female NCO down there who rallies up, whether it's the home guard on a kibbutz or some other soldiers and they just go to get it on and they fight and that's what solves the problem. And it's so it's in, in those cases, it's the micro solutions, micro building on micro, uh, that creates some momentum that stops it versus some, some grand super Cal, you know, super orchestrated uh, solution. You know, for for Afghanistan or Iraq, um, there are so many stories of of close air support taking so long, or a response, or even you know, I'd encourage you to to listen to uh, any any interview of Dakota Meyer. He's a Marine, received a Medal of Honor for rescuing his friends, and he was going in, and this is in a known combat zone, and he's denied artillery fire and close air support repeatedly by army officers and yeah you think militaries become can become bureaucratic and ours has especially become bureaucratic because we've really allowed lawyers to become what zompolits were in the soviet union like a political officer they're there to enforce the will of the party not necessarily to enable commanders to make um efficient decisions to kill the enemy it's a it's a it's a troubled paradigm, and and the IDF got taught a very painful lesson, and I hope that our leaders wake up, and reform our military sooner, so that our uh, men and women in uniform don't have to pay an even bigger uh, uh, cost for leadership's stupidity. Yeah, so let's talk about Palestine and Gaza uh, and Israel. Uh, frame the nature of the conflict for us. I know it's an enormous, enormous back, you know, question, but how, how do you see it? How do you see, how do you frame the, the pieces on the board? Look, uh, the Palestinian people want to live and want a way to advance their, their livelihood. And Hamas as an organization is a terrorist organization with really indiscernible goals from what ISIS would be. And uh, when, when their stated goal is the annihilation of the state of Israel, if you watch even the body cam footage and hear the translations of what these maniacs are saying as they're slaughtering Israelis in their homes, you kind of see what the, what the face of evil is. And so there's um, when, when the United States was fighting Nazi Germany, if the Germans were in the city and the civilians were supposed to, to move, and if they didn't move, the U.S. bombed anyway, and we bombed hard, and that's what's required to extinguish a uh, a truly abhorrent, abhorrent um, um, Nazi act, Nazi esque behavior. And um, so, I, I hope that um, I hope that the Israelis are able to clean out Gaza and 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 free the Palestinian people from a plague like Hamas, so that the rest of them can get on with their lives and and live and prosper. But I don't know that's going to be the case because you have the international diplomatic clique 
and you have an enormous Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood um, money influence um, from between um, uh, heavily from from uh, obviously Iranian support for Hamas, but uh, but but Muslim Brotherhood support significant money and influence coming from Qatar uh, with a propaganda. Uh, mouthpiece like Al Jazeera will continue to cause problems. So that's a that's a reckoning the United States has to have about what foreign monies uh, for all the, the that the left wants to jump up and down about Russia, Russia, Russia influence in the United States. We need to look at um, uh, you know C- Qatar is the largest funder of American universities, the largest foreign funder, and you know where that money is going, and you know that money is going with strings. To push a point, and that's that's what people need to be talking about. Of course, that's not going to be what the Washington elites want to talk about because they're probably on the payroll already. Do you see this flaring up to a larger regional conflict, or maybe even an international war? Or, uh, how do you see this um, if when, when a ground assault starts? I'd be surprised if Hezbollah doesn't do something in the north of um, of Israel. Uh, I would say, and, and, and as that's going. I would say it's a zero or a hundred percent chance of terror attacks from many of the uh, Palestinian or uh, Hezbollah cells already in the United States. When you see the flare up on dozens of American universities, pro Hamas rallies, holy cow, you, you see what rot we have in American universities. But you did not see any of those protests at, at, um, at New St. Andrews or at Hillsdale. No, sir. No. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's certainly, I mean, I saw a news, uh, news report yesterday, so I think it was yesterday, talking about you know, connecting out this conflict to another one, the, 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 the border crisis, open border, uh, uh, people coming in and streaming in, and I think it was DHS, maybe it was Border Patrol, saying that uh, they were seeing uh, – Hamas and other uh, religious you know, extremists, Muslim extremists, coming in through the board, through the southern border, and putting certain states in the border on on alert. You know. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Listen. No, it, it was way past that. I mean, there's tens of thousands of them in Dearborn. There's tens of thousands in New York, in Philadelphia, and we, we we have thousands inside the wire. Tens of thousands inside the wire already. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, a lot of people are coming to grips with uncomfortable truths about limitless diversity. Uh, you know, the last the last couple of weeks. Yep. Well, no, that's a that's a lesson that's going to be seared um, in in over the next two years because it's going to get worse, folks. Buckle up, yeah. Eric. How do you balance? Or how do you see you know the the um, differences between the U.S. as a nation? And then it's its role in a broader, very globalized, uh, you know, geopolitical world. Like our, you know, protecting our interests is not going to involve, but also we are already involved everywhere. Uh, how do you how do you kind of hold those two pieces together? Um, well, we're not a very good we're not very good at running an empire. Mm-hmm. Meaning, and 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 the reason for I'll give a. The, the debacle of the of the fail in Afghanistan will have generational level effects. I remember when when Saigon fell in seventy five. I was six years old. I remember seeing helicopters off the rooftop and something was really bad was happening, and I didn't even re- understand what. But I remember that image. It was seared into my memory. Um, you know, the U.S. has four hundred and ten bases military bases around the world, we, uh, we weigh in, the State Department weighs in on way too many issues that, you know, the, the business of America should be business, not spreading social engineering and transgender or whatever the, the woke culture issue du jour is from Washington. Um, we should we should be trying to transplant the things that made the American economy and our American society great, which was individual rights, private property, limited government, and a, and a representative government somehow, whether that's through a tribal council, through a constitutional monarchy, 
or or a republic like we have. But we weigh in on all way too much stuff. And and uh, as I've said on um, on, on previous podcasts, we have uh, our industries have become way too consolidated. And so we need to do antitrust enforcement and, and to make America much more competitive and much more actually diverse in terms of our economy and, and how many different players are in each segment of the economy. Uh, because competition is good, oligarchies and monopolies exceedingly bad. And that's, and that's what's driving to me a lot of the, um, the, the accelerating collapse of our society. It, it, it's we're, we're behaving more and more like an imperial Rome. Yeah, late stage. And, and, yeah, and it was, you know, remember the, the Visigoths walked into Rome because the Roman soldiers hadn't been paid. And, uh, and so overextension, well, look, the Roman Empire was, um, was a very engineering, uh, you know, their, their economy was not a free market one per se. Theirs was really based on conquest and pillage. Um, didn't have industries like we have today. Um, our, our economy needs to be driven on, on production and manufacturing, not on social engineering or, or sorry, not on financial engineering. And I think, um, uh, what Trump did in trying to bring manufacturing back to America, it actually started a, a positive wave of that happening and, and reinvigorating a lot of American, um, communities. Um, that needs to continue. And uh, look, we need most of all to get a handle on the money supply and the, the unlimited printing that the federal government does is what enables a federal government that just tries to do way too much, way too much stupidity abroad, way too much stupidity at home and putting the whole thing on a diet is uh, absolutely essential. And, and, and I think the country can be fixed within the, you know, the, our founding fathers were truly extraordinary people that they wrote a document 200, almost 250 years ago that in, envisioned uh, and captured the kind of stupidity, stupid things that, that uh, corporate or tribal interests uh, try to do to drive a country apart. And so our federal system... The fact that, and I think COVID was a, was a stark reminder of this, local governments matter. Who your mayor is, who your county commissioners are, um, that matters. And so mm-hmm. try to keep most, most power at that level. And what they can't do, the states do. And the few things that a state government can't do should be done by the federal government. But because we've had this unlimited printing press of money, um, the federal government has grown into doing all these things and they do it exceptionally badly and w- with exceptional cost. And so that needs to be put on a diet and that can be done by states flexing up and saying, no, federal government, we're, we're invoking the 10th Amendment and any power that is not specifically delegated to the federal government remains the sole purview of the states. So F off and we're doing our business. Mm-hmm. How likely do you see that option? Because I mean, that all of that makes sense in terms of localizing decision making um, for government and putting uh, you know, our, our debt on a diet, spending all of that. I think a lot of people are looking at you know 2016 to now and just seeing escalation across the board um, in terms of conflict between left and right. Um, how likely do you see the option of a slow recovery versus a flame out? Good question. <laughs> Good question. Look, it has to get fixed within the constitution. And if it doesn't, then, then you're, you're kind of off script and, uh, and then who knows how it settles yep. and, and going off script is a, is a, uh, is a horror you can't even imagine. I've been to enough war-torn areas and, and places ripped apart, and um, I saw it um, in Bosnia, in Serbia, in Croatia. Uh, I was there right before and right after that civil war started, and it's really ugly. And 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 people will 
you know, we, we suffer in America from affluenza. That's a term I, I coined, right? We have so much money. There is so much wealth and so much comfort that people really forget completely about the basics. And, uh, and that's the real danger because in a, in a conflict, like I was describing in Yugoslavia, things get tribal, things get medieval really quickly. Eric, what, uh, other periods in history do you draw from as you look at our current, our current situation? Oh man. Uh, there's a lot because look, (laughs) um, no, no democratic republic has lasted more than a couple hundred, 250 years. And so the question is, can we, can we defy history and keep this thing going or, or not? Or look, and I'm not, and, and, and don't take this the wrong way, but you know, there's nothing that says the United States of America has to remain 50 states. California wants to go do its thing, do that. Or New York wants to go do its thing, fine. But there's you know, when you look at the, the, the size of each state's economy, I mean, the state of Virginia uh, is the size of Austria. Nobody questions whether Austria should remain a state or not or a, or a country. And so uh, there, are, there are different alternatives to how people want to um, organize their lives. And, uh, and that's up for people to decide on a community by community basis, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that, that was apparent to me in the, uh, especially during the midterms uh, last year where you had some states, I was like, man, these, these, these races are so close, too close in the sense that, I mean, ideally you have all men living peacefully together, but, you know, California was like, I don't know, maybe it was in California, but it was like 48, 52, uh, you know, red and blue. And these are peoples with competing views of reality living in the same state thinking they can they can sort of stay together and we're talking to some guys thinking you know what would the alternative look like where it's like idaho is 90 percent you know 80 percent red and they're like if you want to trans kids you go to california that's 90 percent blue but we just don't do that here and you know yep yeah you know i bought um i'm a resident of wyoming and um I bought the billboard between the airport and uh, the town during COVID with a big Blackwater logo that said, don't California are Cody. Um, um, because there was a lot of influx from California. And, and look, I don't, if you're, if you're leaving badly governed states because of their policies, don't take the bad habits with you when you, when you shift internally. That's, I'm, I'm sure that's going to be a problem in Texas. Because you have a huge influx from California coming to Austin, um, the same uh, that same paradigm. Yeah, and and a huge influx of uh, <laughs> of uh, uh, invaders from the south. So that's a that's a challenge as well for, for Texas. Yep. Well, yeah, and that's the other thing. I, I think the um, I think the Democrat policy of really opening the borders is a is inviting an influx of people that don't have the same habits of liberty that we do and they're coming from countries that have no no basis of coming from a constitutional republic or limited government um they're not coming as uh, as free people they might be wanting freedom but they're coming from a a habit of strongman statism and that is extremely damaging and they make perfect democrats that way so they want to to have the state far more involved in their lives than what uh, I, I guess we would be comfortable with, and that's the that is the real challenge. Now you have what twenty five or thirty million foreign born people in the United States. That's a that's a pretty significant demographic shift. Yeah, Eric, how do we get guys that are dynamic, bold, you know, courageous into positions that uh, these positions of power? I, I in the Sean Ryan. Uh, episode you talked about the uh that story where uh ukraine war flares up and they send this this lady um who is basically just a bureaucrat wendy sherman yeah wendy sherman she's like guys please don't fight and <laughs> they they kind of laugh her off right and comparing that to was it uh, uh reagan reagan that's right sending yeah, so why, why do you tell that story and like, how do you get how do you get guys first of all how did we get to to having these bureaucrats 
you know, in, in these positions? And then how do we reverse that? How do we get guys that are grounded in reality who know how to affect change in these roles? Um, look, that she was she was not a she was not a career. Well, she's a career bureaucrat, but she was put there by the Biden by the Biden team. So that is a clear example of elections having consequences. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you believe that the turnout for our presidential election last, last in 2020 was 92%, I tend to not believe it was that high. And considering how in Australia it's mandatory to vote and you, they fine you if you don't vote, they never get voter turnout much above 82%. So that we somehow miraculously exceeded that by 10 percentage points, I have a hard time believing. So yes, elections do have consequences. Um, it's, um, we need, first of all, we need to turn out people that are so apathetic because uh, they don't think their vote matters. And they have to realize that they have to do something because if they don't vote and, and, and cl- start to clean out the swamp, then it's going to get really, really, really ugly. The consequences of not voting of not solving it within the Constitution means it gets solved off script, and off script is a horrible, the worst option. So that's that's what it is. And then and and it um, look, the federal government will suck less if it's smaller. So let's just make it smaller. That's that's the first thing. How many federal agencies have started a new fiscal year with a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand employees less than they had the previous year? I don't think that's happened probably since the 1940s, maybe. So this endless growth, it can stop. And and if Republicans actually control the House of Representatives and there's appropriators there, they can start to stem the tide by spending less money. You don't have to give a guaranteed um, bump. And if it means shutting the government down to have that fight, fine, shut it down for as long as it takes. But if the Republicans don't stand for le- less government, then we need a different party. Mm-hmm. There's a, a analogs to this um, recently, especially come to mind with Elon Musk buying Twitter, gutting 90% of it is bloated. Yep. I was reading his bio and he goes into the, the evils of cost, you know, cost plus contracts on SpaceX and how he turns that oh, yeah. business around. What I've do you think of Musk? Thing. Yeah, what do you think of Elon Musk? I have maximum admiration for the guy. I mean, I, 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 I've, I haven't read this book yet, but I've seen the documentary films. But I especially appreciate when he, when he was funding SpaceX, and I feel like I'm, when I read his biography, I feel like I'm way behind in life. <laughs> um, <laughs> but when he, when, he, when he took his team out to Johnson Atoll, and he had to get a, a rocket to work, and he had enough money for three rockets, and the first two blew up, and, you know, damn it. It was. It, I, I love it that he is all in all the time, and uh, he put the money down. The rocket worked, and it and it. It's fantastic. So I yeah, that that attitude. I, I've talked a lot about the same experience we've had in government contracting, cost plus versus firm fixed price, and and that's why we focused on being super efficient so we could drive the cost down because we wanted the firm fixed price because we knew what our costs were, and we wanted to underbid everybody. And, um, and that works. And so, yeah, he, he runs into that all the time, the bloated, hyper costly nonsense of the Lockheeds, the Boeings, the, I think it's United Launch Alliance is the cartel that largely controls space launch. And he's taken, he's taken costs down by like 60% for putting stuff in orbit. God bless him. That's the kind of innovation that makes America great. Boeing as a bloated super spender does not make America great. Lockheed does not make America great. They consume enormous money and they get it right once in a while, but at what cost? Yeah, thank you of the, you know, the trajectory of like developing the F-35, for example, the insane amount of bloat, crazy the budgets. Most, the most expensive weapon system in human history, which cannot fly within 25 miles of a, oddly enough, thunderstorm, since they called it the F-35 Lightning. <laughs> <laughs> it can't it wow. can't go super it can't go supersonic because it burns off the radar coating off the skin it, it it look it's it's the embodiment of what's built by super bloated 
Pentagon. And I compare that to, you know, the, the dependence, especially during the global war on terror that the U.S. had on drones. And I compare that to um, the Blue Brothers um, with um, Predator A, Predator B. Um, geez, I can't think of the name of the company now. They're head care, headquartered in La Jolla. Um, General Atomics. The Blue Brothers bought that business in the 80s because they were real estate guys. And it was before they made drones because they literally had – it was the atomic business of General Dynamics. And they then licensed a drone from an Israeli guy and built a Predator A. And the agency used those a bit. And in the, in the Kosovo-Bosnia debacle, and then the agency, it's Kofor Black, said, we really need to make this armed. Let's make it armed. It was not the military. It was not the Air Force. Certainly, they didn't want anything to do with unmanned aircraft. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was because of General Atomics and innovation from the CIA is why Predator A was armed when 9-11 happened. And obviously, they sold a lot of stuff after that. And they took the money they made from Pred A and they built Pred B. Bigger, turboprop, all the rest. And then they built Pred C, which is jet Stealthy internal weapons carriage. That's and and of course at that point they start running into hard into the Northrop, Lockheed, Boeing, cartel of nonsense. But great company, privately owned, and I hope it survives into the next generation, being private, mean, and um, uh, vigorously competitive. Yeah, because we need we need that. Yeah, no, Twitter is an optimistic example of, you know, you would have never thought that that, that company could be turned around the way it was. And then, you know, in a matter of, of 12 months, you just saw a dramatic change. Um, sure. And, the, and the, the leftist elites will do all they can to deplatform and to make it hard to get ad revenue. And that's fine. I would imagine because of his experience in PayPal and doing online payments, he will turn it into somehow an online banking transaction system mm -hmm. and he will yeah I, I, that's a guy that's playing 3d chess and i wouldn't i would not bet against him for sure yeah it, inspiring for guys in general i think who who see the decay the bureaucratic monolithic the structures of our time and then see somebody a guy who can exert will and and vision and experience in a particular direction uh that's how that's how a lot of guys want to live their lives well and and that example again is really like Musk is a really interesting, so many interesting stories there, but with, uh, I think they get into this in the recent biography, but with um, his SpaceX stuff, with the um, Starlink satellites now in the Ukraine conflict, like Elon Musk was making strategic calls in that conflict in terms of, you know, uh, when Ukraine was sending a mission of, of remote subs over to, um, to do a mission, he said, nope that's not going to happen. And he just turned them off and they all, they all turn off and they drift away. Like he was making, you know, state level decisions in a conflict on the other side of the world because he had developed this, um, you know, this network of satellites, this private company. And so uh, things are getting really strange in terms of that overlap um, between public and private. Because he has developed significant strategic infrastructure with no government money. Yep. Yeah. No. Good on him. Yeah. And, and trust me, the left in Washington hates him for it. Yeah, I believe it. Uh, Eric, what are you, so you sold Blackwater, you doing front, uh, Frontier Research Group. Uh, talk a little bit about that and talk about also uh, what you're doing next. Well, I'll talk about what's next now. Um, Great. So I, I think when, um, when the post analysis and I'm, I got to jump to this because I have 10% left on my phone of battery. Uh, when the post op is done on Gaza, I will predict highly, uh, with, with, with high confidence, that the Hamas guys gathered huge amount of their intelligence from cell phone data, from the ad data that you can buy commercially. And they just sat and watched those kibbutzes, they watched those bases, and they watched when people flowed in, they watched where the phones were bedding down. Where the little, where the nineteen and twenty year old soldiers are going when they're when they're um, off duty, you can see where the duty station is, the where the op center is. So you can literally trace to that level of detail where the cell phone data is going. 
and that's commercially available. And so from a, a front office in Europe, somebody could have bought cell phone data for the whole southern area of Israel for a few thousand dollars. And you sit and you analyze that. And it's not down to individual people, but you can see the flows of bodies. And uh, from there, they can, I mean, because as you watch the tapes of, um, uh, of the Hamas guys assaulting these places, uh, they're saying, okay, no, turn right. That door should be unlocked. That's extraordinarily good intel. I don't think they had inside moles inside the IDF selling out their country. They did that with cell phone data, commercially available cell phone data. In the same way that the U.S. can watch when a bunch of cell phone signals turn off in Vladivostok, for example, and then they see a ship pulling out, they say, ah, okay, those 450 cell phones belong to the crew of the XYZ Russian Navy ship. Same way the Russians and I'm sure the Chinese do the same thing to all U.S. military personnel. You saw a um, uh, story a few years ago about uh, a bunch of uh, fitness trackers all showing up at some weird base in Yemen. Yeah. Well, a bunch of special operators there from the United States doing PT every morning. So, look, after seeing what happened with the censorship of big tech um, after the during and after the 2020 election, um, I had a, a team that we were working on a, uh, a forensic cyber tool already. And our it turns out our CTO was the um, was the guy that developed Pegasus which is a, uh, a, a, a notorious, effective cyber inject um, to go onto phones. And then he, after he'd done Pegasus, he did um, he built a very secure phone for governments. Then he went, actually went on to build um, a phone that controls most of the world's pacemakers. And so he'd done the, the hardware operating system piece before. And so we said, we're going to do our own. Uh, and that is, uh, that is this. Uh, today, this is a uh, new phone. It's called Unplugged. Um, it's um, it's unique in that it doesn't have an operating system. I mean, sorry, it doesn't have an advertising ID. It has its own hardware, its own operating system, its own secure messenger and store. And so you can buy these now. We just delivered the first 500 of them. Um, you can order them at unplugged.com. Uh, because we control our endpoints, because it's our store, uh, and and we guarantee that the phone is not collecting on you. I learned really a, a, a distinct way is I, I managed to piss off my wife. She sent me a scorcher of a text on WhatsApp. And for the next two weeks, she's getting nonstop advertising from divorce lawyers and from Match.com. Because your phone, your Google or Apple phone, okay, if you have an Android, it's running Google mobile services. And if you're running an iPhone, um, you're running uh, the iOS, both of those collect and resell your data to the tune of about $180 per year. They know where you go, what you buy, who you call, and what you browse. And you don't really have any say in it because in that long user agreement that you scroll through when you, when you open the phone, when you started with it, you're accepting all of that criteria. This is the opposite of that. Um, so you buy the phone for $950. Bucks, um, um, and it's our hardware, our operating system. We can host a lot of other apps on the phone. We have a, thousands of apps in our store, but our operating system blocks those apps from putting their hooks in you to harvest and mine your data, to, to turn the microphone on, to turn your GPS on, as is done routinely by the other apps on, on the other guy's phones. So it's not for everybody. If you posted what you had for breakfast on Instagram, probably not for you. But if you're an adult um, that cares about your data privacy and, um, you know, it, well, and even for kids, there was just an article in The Atlantic um, a few weeks ago, and it said by the time a kid reaches the age of 13, there will be 70 some million data points collected by advertisers on that mm. kid. Okay, effectively, like digital grooming, figuring out all your preferences of how to reach that person with their preferences for food, travel, colors, sound, whatever it might be, it's, uh, it's very, very dangerous. And especially in an age of AI, do you want people knowing that much about who you are, what you are, where you go, and what your choices are? Mm -hmm. 
And so, and also this phone, you can actually turn it off, which sounds like a funny thing to say, but like, <laughs> yes, I can't actually no. get this phone to stop. Th this phone data. actually has, has a kill switch right here, which physically separates the battery from the electronics. So that off is off. Uh, this is also, um, I'll just unlock it here. Um, we have a, um, there's actually a privacy center, which is the first of its kind, which is actually a firewall. It is a firewall on a phone that you can manually, um, everything from blocking Wi -Fi, unsecure Wi-Fi networks, the Bluetooth, NFC, you know, the touch to pay camera location, USB port. You know, when you plug your phone in on the back of a, the seat back in an airplane, they can suck all your data out through your phone unless you have this, preventing that from happening. Mm -hmm. uh, blocking adwares and trackers, block adult websites, gambling websites, etc. So it's um, it's available now. Our um, look, there's four billion cell phones in the world. I think uh, I think there's a, a a a large amount of people that are ready to have something that they control their data. They own their data with a very secure messenger that uh, does not have any back doors. And um, we, we actually, a year and a half ago, a year and two months ago, we, um, we put out a bounty program at the DEF CON Hacker Conference to hack our messenger and uh, still unhacked. So we, um, we, we wanted to crowdsource that security. Nice. That's awesome. Great. Well, we'll have the link in the, in the show notes. Uh, and Eric, since before your, your phone runs out, uh, battery, and uh, we run out of time here, last two questions. So... Uh, as you look at 2024, let's not think even 10, 50 years in the future, it's 2024. Uh, what, what are your predictions? What are your bets? And on the flip side, like what makes you hopeful in the, in the midst of, of the craziness around us? Well, everybody that says it can't get any worse in America, it can get worse. It can get a lot worse. And, and we killed 600,000 Americans solving some issues in 1861 to 1865. And let's not get to that. Let's solve this at the ballot box. And, um, and for the people that have been uh, asleep and uh, not caring, it's time to wake up and to care. And I think, uh, I think that the American people are waking up to that. And I think the hegemony of information that, that the elites and big tech have tried to lord over the American people is uh, that lock is leaking again. Uh, meaning, more and more people are waking up and we're, we'll find the truth. And, and look, they don't, it's pretty simple. You go to the gas pump and you're paying twice as much for gasoline as you did a few years ago. Yeah, they, they see that. And, and the inflation and all the rest, I think the only reason the economy hasn't really crumbled is because of the ridiculous amounts of deficit spending we're doing. And uh, that, that, um, that game of musical chairs is about to run out because we just can't keep spending. Speaking of the ballot box, when when will Eric Prince be on the ballot box? <laughs> Never. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. Uh, all right. Well, Eric, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate your time. Uh, great to see you. And uh, we'll we'll make sure to, to put the phone and uh, all, the, all the rest on the show notes. All right, boys. Have a good day. Cheers. Thank Sounds you. Good. Thanks.